Group asks INEC to conduct CVR exercise before Emo, Bayelsa and Kogi governorship elections. And the People's Democratic Party National Working Committee reserves or reverses McCarthy's suspension. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Ayn O'Connor. A civil society organization, Catch Them Young Community Initiative, has urged the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to conduct continuous voter registration before the forthcoming general and governorship elections in Imo, Bayelsa, and Kogi states. Uh, the group said it is concerned about participation of youth in the November 11 governorship elections in Imo state. The group noted that while youth constitutes the majority of registered voters in Nigeria, they also constitute the highest number of citizens that are yet to register. It therefore called on INEC to ensure Imo youths are able to register and have their voices heard during the November elections. Um, well, joining us to discuss this, uh, I have Reverend Raymond Anoliefo. He is the D Director, Justice Development and Peace Center. And also joining us will be um, Moshud Isa, who is a development expert. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Anoliefo, for joining us. I hope I got it right. Yeah, you did well. I'll give you 50%. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> okay. Now, it's very important um, because in, in my opening, I noted that um, Nigeria's um, population is mostly youthful. And every single day, whether we like it or not, somebody turns 18. That means that there is more and more need for us to have a continuous voter registration. But INEC calls what it does in a short space of time, a continuous voter registration, but then they stop and then conduct elections. And after that, the process is stalled. Um, why is it so difficult for us to have a portal that's open to young people to continue voting every time they turn 18? Okay, thank you very much, Anne, for having me. Um, section 9 of the Constitution sorry, of the, of the 2022 Electoral Act, does provide that registration of voters, updating and revision of the register of voters, shall not stop later than 90 days before any election covered by this Act. But like you pointed out, what we call CVR in this country is probably not in the best. It's not CVR. It's not continual voter registration. As much as we would want behind it to uh, live up to its billing and do what the electoral law requires of it, but we are inundated in a country where uh, INEC itself will go back on its guidelines, will go back on its laws, and probably nothing happens. INEC already has reeled out a lot of activities leading up to the November 11 election for the three states in the off cycle elections, but nothing has been said concerning continual voter registration. Uh, I think it's important, like you pointed out, a lot of young persons have just turned 18, and we saw what happened in the, in the last, in the election we just concluded, that a lot of persons still couldn't collect their PVCs, some couldn't even register. I, I think it is only appropriate um, that INEC will do what it's needful by opening up its portal that young people and all well-meaning Nigerians in those three states who desire to be part of the electoral process should be allowed to vote mm. or allowed to register. Uh, we, we also noticed that um, there were so many gaps and problems in terms of voters' cards after the registration process. We saw again that there was a high number, and in fact, unprecedented increase in the number of young people who registered just before the general elections uh, in February. But most of the complaints that were, were recorded were either that these people were unable to get their PVCs or their PVCs were missing. And I'm sure that if you followed the news, you had seen PVCs that were recovered in different places, in sacks, in bags. Um, for, for, for instance, in Lagos on election day, a bag of PVCs were recovered and people started going to knock on doors to ask people if you know, they could receive their PVCs. I mean, 
so registration, yes, is one very important key issue that we're discussing today. But again, why does it seem like even if INEC throws its doors open to those who would register, um, getting the cards might also be an issue? Um, the elections are almost around the corner, whether we like it or not. In a few months, we will be gearing up for those uh, off-cycle elections. What's the guarantee that even if people are registered today, those PVCs will be gotten in time for them to participate? Well, there, there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. But I, I, I could be a stickler for laws. The law is clear that not later than 90 days. So all that INEC needs to do is to open up its portals for people to register. Let we, we must get to that point in this country where you know we do what is expected, the right thing. I just think um, with all that INEC has said leading up to this uh, to the off cycle elections, the, the, the focus was mainly on the political parties and of course on the politicians who, were, who are going to, um, to throw their hearts in the ring, in the race. But not much consideration was actually given for the electorate. Mm. No consideration. Okay, as it's simple, allow us to register. Now, let's register. That's one thing. When the registrations are done, hopefully, if we have to calculate 90 days from November, we'll be talking about the registrations end, ending about uh, sometime in August. Now, after that, I never can do what it needs to do, print the cards. Since the, the states are fewer, it shouldn't take them so long, and then they can do that. Mm. And then, of course, with the, with the push of civil society organizations and all the other interested groups to, for people to go and pick up their PVCs. Now, the truth is, because it's a smaller election, um, the, the area mass to cover is not so large, I don't think we're going to have the same problems, especially with logistics or preparations from INEC and all of all those bottlenecks that we experienced in the general elections, which was, of course, a much wider uh, coverage. But I don't think we are going to experience that. Uh, permit me to add that I think if, if INEC is interested in inclusivity, if INEC is interested in walking the talk, then they have nothing else to do than to at least, even if it's for a month or two, allow for continuous voter registration. A lot of persons are angling for it. Mm. A lot of young persons are angling to, to get registered, to be part of it. You know, the, the last election, the general elections, have already shown us that we can, we can, we can change the, the status quo. We can do something if given the enabling environment. And that's simply what we're asking INEC to do in this regard. Allow for continuous voters' registration at least up until 90 days to the, to the elections. Okay. Well, Mashud Isa is just joining us via telephone. Mashud, um, just as we've been having this conversation before you joined us, uh, groups are calling on INEC, young people are calling on INEC to open its portal and allow for continuous voter registration, which I have a problem with. I'm wondering why we call it continuous if it's being stopped from time to time. What do you think the major challenge is for INEC, and why is that portal not being open, being that INEC doesn't need any serious logistics to keep that portal open? Mashud, can you hear me? Well, I don't think he can hear me, so I'm going to throw that question back to you, um, Raymond. Well, I just think um, uh, continuous, like you pointed out, it's ongoing. Uh, probably not necessarily it has to continue um, ad infinitum. Probably at a certain point in time, it can always stop so that we, the, the, the data collected can be properly aggregated and then, of course, processed and then some, and cleaned up. Generally, that's what um, INEC is expected to do. And that's why there's a provision of the law. If the law says 90 days, not later than 90 days before the election, can I please try at least not to go back on its own guidelines? INEC uh, has a guideline for this. The electoral law has been passed in 2022, and these things are clear there. Uh, we, it's not supposed, the truth is, we are not supposed to be 
angling about this. We are not supposed to quarrel or fight about this or begin to make me make bones out of this. But because of the country where we are, where there are no penalties for reaching offenses, um, no serious penalties to such uh, malfeasance coming from a body like INEC, who is supposed to be the electoral umpire. I think at this stage, INEC has a lot of redeeming of its image to be to do, mm. Mm. and this this can be a process. This mm. can be at least a step in the right direction by INEC. Lovely, um, Mashud, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Let's talk about INEC redeeming its um, <laughs> its image in the eyes of the average Nigerian because. Uh, many people would say that INEC talked a, a good game just before the elections, but then they delivered something that looked like um, nothing close to what they, you know, apparently billions or trillions were um, sunk, in the, sunk into, into the electoral process and the whole elections. In fact, if INEC had asked for more money, I'm guessing INEC could have gotten it. But um, here we are, still looking at what happened um, during the general elections and the uh, governorship elections that held ac across the country. Um, how, what do you tell an 18-year-old who sat and watched what played out in February and in March? The fact that se several people did register, they could not get access to their PVCs, and also uh, the fact that, hey, we're asking them to register so that they can be ready for another election. Uh, what exactly can we tell those people to get them involved in the process? Okay, uh, not, not to hold a uh, sway for INEC or not to say INEC has done well, but what you can tell to an average 18-year-old is that democracy is a process and then the, the process doesn't used to be as good as this like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Of course, we expected something much, much better, considering the fact that a lot of civil society organizations had pushed and ensured that a new electoral law was passed to encourage electoral reform, to encourage transparency. Of course, we are not where we wanted to be, but I promise you we are not where we used to be as regards our electoral process. Just that we had gave a lot of hope and expectations to Nigerians in the 2023 general election. And unfortunately, we did not meet up to that expectation, especially during the presidential election. But we could see that after the presidential election, during the governorship election, there was a bit of improvement from the process. It means the process can actually be better than it used to be. And it can actually be better than what we delivered in the 2023 presidential election from what we saw in the governorship election. It means there is hope. It means there is a good framework on ground to ensure that we have a very credible election. We just need the right people. We just need the right political will to ensure that we deliver credible election. Hmm. And when we talk about the right people and the, you know, the willpower, people who have the, you know, the, the, um, the interest of the average Nigerian at heart, who are these people? Because it sounds like these people are not anywhere within the space that we're conversing in. Um, we just uh, finished an election. Uh, are we supposed to hope that those people who have emerged will be the people that you're making reference to that will help us to push this process further? Because I wanted to ask you in the middle of the conversation, if... You, because you said we're not where we're supposed to be, but should we still be where we are right now in 2023 when the whole world is trying to go to the moon? So our, our democracy is uh, 24 years old, consecutively, right from, 20, uh, right from 1999 till now. And when, when I say we need the right people to be in the right place, and we need the political will, I know there are a lot of accusing fingers on the, on the INEC chairman. But alone, he is not the only person. I recall that there was a time that um, the president nominated some set of people to be resident electoral commissioners, to be national commissioners, and there, there were agitation that this set of people are car carry members of political parties. They are partisans. There were calls around that. So those are the political will I'm talking about. 
It is one thing to have a good framework. It's another thing to have the right people in the right place. We have national commissioners. We have resident electoral commissioners. We have electoral officers at the local government level that were known to be card carry members. They are known to be partisans. So this, uh, to a reasonable extent, could have affected the delivery of um, credible elections in Nigeria. Of course, in 2023, we should have gone better than this, obviously. But again, democracy is a process. And then, of course, we are hoping to have uh, the right people in the right place. We are hoping the, uh, those, those that have the power will appoint the right people in the right place. Remember in 20, 2007, when uh, Yaradua, the late Yaradua, became president, he came out to say the process that brought him to power was a flawed process. And that, that was what led to the development of the UH Committee. And one of the recommendations of that committee says that the appointment of the INEC chairman and the uh, national commissioners should not be in the hands of the president, should be in the hands of the state the judicial, uh, and maybe a judicial committee or something. But then we have not been able to actually implement a substantial part of that uh, recommendation. Again, it's a process. For every electoral law that has been passed, there is an opportunity that with every election that comes, is an opportunity to test those laws and see where the gaps are in those laws and see where we can bridge those gaps. So beyond the appointment of the chairman, we we'll notice that some resident electoral commissioners are partisan, some national commissioners are partisan, some electoral office, of, uh, officers in the local government level are, are more like yes boys to the governors of those states. Mm. So those are some those gaps that we need to bridge. But at the moment, we need to harness the law we have. We need to implement those laws to the latter to ensure that um, these uh, these laws deliver a credible election okay. to a very very large extent. All right, let me come back to you, Raymond. Um, almost a similar question I asked um, Mashud a few minutes ago. We're here to canvas for people who are going to keep turning 18 so that we can increase the number of people who vote, who decide, who leads us at state, federal, and local government levels. But how easy is it going to be a task to get these same people, like I said to him, to register and be part of a process that they somewhat have lost trust in? I'll tell you why. Um, there are people who... The media was in the forefront with civil society trying to get people to register, to pick up their PVCs, telling them how important and how powerful that piece of card is. But of course, after the elections, people still don't feel the same way they felt before the election. How easy a task is this going to be, Raymond? Well, it's definitely not going to be an easy task, you know, at this time. Um, generally, as a people, uh, we, we have not fully trusted the Independent National Electoral Commission. And so there's a trust deficit that we are working from. And somehow, the hopes that the 2023 general elections were going to assist greatly to assuage the hopes and the, the belief in the system once again, to a large extent, was dashed. A lot of persons didn't feel that the 23 general elections went on as expected and um, hopes were lost. Uh, we practice incremental democracy. And then uh, I quite agree with uh, Moshud um, when he opines that uh, we, we are not where we used to be as much as we are not where we are supposed to. Uh, there is some uh, progress. There's some progress. But that said, I think... It's like it's like we a child who goes to school, and out of twenty students, and it comes um, a tint in class, and there's a query as to why are you performing badly in studies, and the person points that at least there are those who came nineteenth and twentieth. You know, we, we we should. I wouldn't want to always always um, cut the slack for the institutions of government. I think the government knows what they are doing. 
I think we, we have the enabling environment when these laws are put in place. Uh, but the, the people to drive this process, just like Mr. Moshudo was saying, the people, the persons to drive this process, we, we just have to keep fine-tuning, fine-tuning, hoping that we get the right people to do the right thing so that we can get square pegs into square holes. And then hopefully things can get better. I know a lot of young persons, I work with them a great deal, are uh, a bit devastated and sad, and some are not particularly optimistic about future elections. But this is where, uh, like we said at the introductory part of this conversation, where I think INEC needs to do better to be able to ensure and um, give the hope, give hope to somewhat of a hopeless situation. It's not all doom and gloom, uh, but we must continue to push the agenda that things can be done better, that we can actually get this process right. And then, of course, we'll continue to encourage the young persons. This is the only country that we have. No matter what we say about it, it is because we love this country. It is because we want this country to be better. And as much as is possible, we, we have to constantly, constantly speak truth to power. Not because we despise or we are going to attack anyone, but because we want this country to work for the greater majority of us, for the benefit of everyone. Because I can tell you, we have all it takes, both human, natural, and uh, all the resources that we have. We have all it takes mm. to make this country the toast of the world. Mm. Let's talk accountability quickly before I go back to um, Moshud. How do we get uh, the Independent National Electoral Commission to be accountable to Nigerians, bearing in mind also that it's taxpayers' monies that was, you know, um, given to INEC to deliver on this election. Of course, we know that um, many, were, many applauded when Mr. President was finally assented to the Electoral Act that was amended recently. It was, you know, uh, an applaud. People were excited that it was one of the things that Mr. President um, would be remembered for um, when he does leave office. But then in terms of getting the electoral body to be accountable, who holds INEC to accountability? How do we go about getting INEC to be accountable, including the man at the helm of affairs? Yeah, accountability is key. Accountability is key. And immediately after the elections, uh, we had a press conference in the office where we gave a preliminary report. And part of what we said was also the fact that there is a need to audit, if nothing else, the voter register. The voter register. So that to a large extent, when we begin to bandy figures, INEC said we had 94 million, about 94 million registered voters. And then it is something about 86 to 88 million uh, voters collected their, their, their PVCs. But the turnout of the elections well, left a lot more to be desired. Now, the question is, what exactly happened with that in that regard? What exactly happened? What happened to the cards? We, do we, had, we had, probably had a lot of ghost or maybe fake registrations. Or people came out, but somehow the entire voters uh, were just under 35 million. And we are wondering where exactly did we get it wrong. And then when we talk about holding INEC accountable, I think, of course, this is where the National Assembly must come out. Hopefully in the 10th Assembly, as we set, as they go about having what we call agenda setting, for this 10th assembly that is going to come, probably they might have to, we might also have to review again our electoral law. Beginning from the appointment of the INEC chair, must it have to be the, must it be the president? So, so that some of these processes, we can get them right and we can actually hold them to account for what has happened. Mm. Look at the, how Beavers, to a large extent, performed its function of accreditation. But then when it got to transmission of results real time, it was a completely different kettle of fish. Up until now, IREV doesn't have the entire results from the country uploaded. So there's a whole gamut of issues. And a lot of money was voted for this election. And I'm sure more money will be voted for the off-cycle elections as well. Mm. And who is going to account for all of that? I think the National Assembly has some work to do the institution, we must begin to build strong institutions that can, you know, possibly after the elections, the Professor Mahmoud, the INEC chair, should be able to answer 
question should be should be held accountable for certain things. Questions should be asked and answers should be provided mm. because the taxpayers' money, like you said. So I think transparency and accountability is key. And this we must continue to emphasize. Okay. Back to you, Mashud. Um, let's talk about um, um, other issues aside from the accountability because, you know, when we say that, oh, the National Assembly, if the National Assembly seemed to be ben ben or benefited from the lapses in INEC uh, or the electoral process, uh, why would they want to in any way hold INEC accountable? That's one thing. Again, um, what are the other avenues that we can use to reach these young people? Because they are our target, this conversation. Getting more and more of them to um, register and see the importance and the need to be part of the electoral process. Uh, our young people today have been given to all kinds of vices, whether we like it or not. And they're very, um, they, they, their attention span is pretty short. How do we go about to get the attention of these young people? Aside from those who go to school uh, that, that have some access to civic education, what about those who do not have basic education? How do we get about go about getting their attention? Okay, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Again, there are various tools for communicating and reaching out to to these young people, no matter your educational status. And then there's always opportunity to collaborate with other agencies. And whenever this discussion comes up, I always make reference to the National Orientation Agency. The National Orientation Agency has office in Abuja, they have 36 state offices, and they have 774 local government offices. It means they are down to the grassroots. There is an immense opportunity to actually collaborate with these agencies, to actually reach out to young people, irrespective of their educational status, religion, or tribe. There are also a lot of civil society organizations doing a lot of grassroots, grassroots work. So we have immense opportunity to actually collaborate with different groups and reach out to these uh, people. It is one thing to have an electoral law. It is one thing to have an electoral process. But it's another thing for people to understand the importance of participating in this process and the nothing for people to even know how to participate in this, pro in this process. If you educate people enough to tell them why and how their votes will count and the importance of their vote and the importance of the fact that, that their cost of living, their standard of living is connected to all the political decisions they make, then it will go a long way in enable enabling them to participate. Mm. But before then, if you educate them that and promise them you are going to do certain things to make sure their votes count, then you actually have to also do your own part and ensure that their, their vote actually counts. And there is also power in storytelling. In 2003, 2007, to be honest, you might be on the tree wanting to vote. And the result of that polling unit or the result of that state will even be announced. If you tell them that story and how we were before and how we are now, and tell them the progress we've made, and tell them the potential of progress we will make if they participate and ask the right question and demand accountability. Then it will go a long way in ensuring that their participation will not be futile. Okay. So my, my thought is that we have to collaborate with the right agencies, to reach out to people irrespective of their educational status or their tribal background, and also do our own part in ensuring that um, the promises we made about their votes being ca uh, counting also goes a long way. All right. But again, beyond the election, we also know that citizens, the role of citizens is just beyond voting. You have to also demand accountability. You All have right. to also make people, uh, politicians know that immediately they emerge uh, into position of power. You have to ask them the right question. You have to ask them to fulfill their promises. I have to remind them that if they don't fulfill their promises, you have the power to vote them out. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you on that note to Moshudi Sa. He's a communications and development expert. And, of course, Reverend Raymond Anoliefo. He is the Director, Justice, Development and Peace Centre. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for having this conversation with me. And we, we have to continuously have these kinds of conversations. Yeah, thank surely. you. Surely. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much. Well, we'll take a quick break, and when we return, we'll be discussing 
Uh, the reversal of the PDP's suspension of former Governor of Kaduna State, Ahmed Makarfi. Stay with us.